Good morning. Welcome to Wooden Spoons on CKUW 95.9 FM in Winnipeg. My name is Debbie, and I'm here with community nutritionist Mary Jane Eason to discuss topics of healthy living, environmental issues, what's going on in our community, and other interests in this one-hour show. On Wooden Spoons, we recognize that all things are related, and with learning and awareness, we connect the dots that make up our world. Every Friday morning on Wooden Spoons, we speak with guests on today's relevant issues, share nutritious recipes, and explore important topics with perspectives not found in the mainstream media. We are broadcasting from the ancestral lands of Treaty 1 First Nations and the home of the Métis people. And we source our water from Shoal Lake, 41st Nation. And the time right now is a minute past eight, and the temperature outside is a lovely five degrees. It's clear, bit of a wind this morning from the southwest, and it should be a lovely sunny day. And good morning, Mary Jane. How are you doing? Well, good morning, Debbie. Oh, I'm doing quite well. Um, We were all coming down with some flu, (laughs) and so for the past week, it's been, uh, you know, taking things easy and uh, just coping with uh, whatever comes along. But, uh, you know, um, quite, uh, you know, I'm feeling much, much better. And so we're just, uh, I'm glad to be back on the radio program and uh, glad to hear that you're also back because you had taken a bit of a uh, time out there when you were, um, you were not feeling well. Yeah, COVID so. finally got me after a, a two and a half years. So <laughs> I, I had a little bout with it, but I'm good now. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of uh, things going around around this time of year and uh, possibly as uh, some uh, researchers like to suggest it's due to the fact that at this time of the year our vitamin D levels are more lower they're lower because we're not exposed to the sun the same way and the sunshine is a great uh, um, is the way we get our vitamin D in our bodies and, and uh, that's our a, a great protection against a lot of things that come around Anyway, this morning we have a full show, and um, we are being joined by uh, Marie LeBlanc as our guest. Uh, She had been on Wooden Spoons in October 2021 uh, to to promote her film and her art prints. Uh, Marie holds a Bachelor of Arts in Human Geography and Sociology from the University of Manitoba, and uh, she has participated in the making our mark number two printmaking mentorship program at martha street studio um she worked at the artist in residency program at art Booth studio and the art salon program at arts accessibility network manitoba and uh, she was recently awarded micro grants from mentoring artists for women's art and for the completion of overdressed that's the name of the a program she uh, uh, composed, and her dreams of being of using her degree in human geography and sociology to pursue a career in ecotourism went by the wayside when she developed environmental illnesses such as multiple chemical and elect- electromagnetic sensitivities. So instead, she expressed herself through the art of photography and making short films. Originally from northern Manitoba, Marie lived in Winnipeg before relocating to Alberta. And uh, today we will be talking to Marie about her program, about her show, that will be shown at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights on October the 29th. And we'll we'll also learn about the hidden environmental illnesses that afflict sensitive people who are forced to live on the fringes of society. And so that's part of her work, is to educate the public about um, uh, environmental diseases. And so this is the first part of our morning. We'll be talking to Marie. And for the second part of the program, um, we will be talking about um, topics of nutrition and sharing a recipe and so on. 
And um, on that note, I'd like to welcome Marie uh, to our program. Good morning, Marie. Good morning. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Okay, well, um, I'm glad that you were able to join us, and it's been, um, it has been um, a little bit of a challenge to get everything together, <laughs> but um, <laughs> under the circumstances. <laughs> anyway, Marie, uh, <clears throat> I'm glad that you made it, and um, as a self-taught multidisciplinary artist, tell us about the work that you do and the themes that you explore. Tell us about your work. Okay. Um, through photography, multimedia production, short film, performance, and wordsmithing, I explore themes related to landscape, isolation, beauty, health, and nature. I often capture faces, shapes, shadows, and reflections. A lot of times I superimpose myself in reflections. I do it with digital and on-camera effects. But most importantly, is my theme of sharing the stories of others and often my own story, sharing our strength and our struggles and expressing our need for help, you know, that we need to meet, we need help to meet our most basic human needs. Besides the short film, which we'll talk about later, I have two other important projects to date, which have been Overdress and Who Says We Need Fresh Air. And Overdress is when I wore the dress in the middle of the desert performing every basic need on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And who says we need fresh air is something I would love to go across Canada with. Um, it's quotes from people from around the world I project onto structures, and I've done that you know, quite extensively in Manitoba and different other places throughout Western Canada. Yes, so there, there is um, certainly um, a lot of challenges for you in in you know not only exploring your art but surviving um, with uh, uh, multiple chemical sensitivities. But we will talk about that a little later too. Um, but maybe right now, could you tell us about the sponsorships you're able to get and what kind of support groups assist in the production of the work that you do? Okay. Um, well, I've part as you mentioned, I participated in the Making Our Mark to Printmaking Mentorship Program, and that resulted in the Canary in the Coal Mine Art Show in 2016, and that was at Martha Street Studio. And I participated in the Art Salon Program at Art and Accessibility Network Manitoba with Yvette Tineridi as my mentor. And I received a couple micro-grants to help with the mentorship and completion of my work. And all of the above programs were through Arts and Accessibility Network Manitoba, they have been so instrumental in helping me complete applications, um, just any any part that I need to get farther um, for an art show, things I don't understand, they're more than happy to explain. I can't I not even express enough my thanks to Janelle for always helping me who's happy and inspiring. You know, they're able to help so many people with artists with disability and recently, she helped tremendously in my part in a recent presentation for Accessible Parks 2022 conference that they had, and I did a presentation for that. And also, um, Paul Turgeon um, also helped me a lot um, in my project to bring the technical side to completion. So I've, I'm fortunate, so fortunate that way. Otherwise, I couldn't even be doing any of this. Mm hmm. Well, this is an important um, an important piece of of every everyone's life is having the support they need, and uh, it's it's uh, wonderful that that you are receiving some kind of help and uh, support for the programs in the art artistry that you are doing, and um, you are doing you're going to be offering a program at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights on October the 29th, and that addresses mm -hmm. uh, the experience of certain individuals with multi-chemical sensitivities, um, if that is what you are exploring. Do you want to go tell us about that that uh, work that you're doing at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights on October 29th? Okay. Um, I'm sharing a short film called Multiple Chemical Sensitivity and Environmental Illness Awareness and Acknowledgement. And it's, it's won three awards already. I'm hoping it would win more <laughs> because it would be nice to have, you know, to, to, I guess, get the information out there about 
multiple chemical sensitivity. Um, and it's sharing the stories from people living with it. I'm going to say environmental sensitivities because it's at the Human Rights Museum and environmental sensitivities is the word we use in Canada. Even though the film says environmental illness, so I'll keep saying environmental sensitivities um, because it's going to be at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Because um, in Canada, that's what we use. There is, it falls under, under this umbrella, falls multiple chemical sensitivity, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, and mold illness. The stories in the short film illustrate the distress that was with environmental sensitivities or environmental illness face and the barriers they encounter. I met them along my journey and I, they are just wonderful people. The short film will explore stories of how the body and mind are affected through struggles of being misunderstood in the modern world of a chemical society. Often those with environmental sensitivities live on the fringes of society, unable to enter buildings that use sense, Wi-Fi, cell towers, electrical devices, have mold, and so much more. Even inside their homes is a challenge, and many just cannot afford to do what it takes or what they need and required to help them financially to make even their place safe. Because environmental sensitivities is recognized by the human rights yet still not given a billing fee code or classification of diseases code in Canada, those with environmental sensitivities have no recourse to petition the government for safe housing and meet their medical and basic needs. They're often forced to find a creative way to shelter, which does not affect their health or affects their health less by living off grid or even living in vans or houses adapted to a chemical and set free environment away from the modern conveniences, all including cell towers. It not only educates the general public, about the struggles of those with environmental sensitivities that gives a voice to their stories which are often not heard. Um, there's, there's strength to fight to live in the modern day world filled with harmful chemicals and ability to continue the fight to have their basic human needs met is illustrated in the short film. Um, yes, and, and multiple chemical sensitivities is something that is not really well known or really well understood or even you know accepted a lot of people think oh is this in your imagination maybe you hear things like that um, it is a real illness and there are people who have that but they are so hidden from society because they uh, they're 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 being forced out of living in society. Um, how did you discover that you had environmental illness, and um, well, how did that affect you all altogether? Okay. Um, well, even though I had health problems in my younger years, I became sicker in university you know, while living in places sprayed with pesticides, and then there was mold and fragrances and cigarette smoke and just kept getting worse and worse and then my health declined further 30 years ago when I was bit by a tick. I knew I had multiple chemical sensitivity and my general practitioner sent me to a Nova Scotia specialty clinic I think in 2011 around there to get diagnosed then I came back and I just couldn't afford the treatment so that's how I was diagnosed and then in 2016 I lost most all I owned due to mold and shortly after I was sent to Alberta to see an environmental doctor here and now my treatment or what I have to do is be sent to the to live in the desert because I'm unable to tolerate um, modern housing or just housing so for me my lived experiences my struggles and the struggles of others and our need to have our basic needs met motivates me to go beyond my comfort zone excuse me to create art sorry about that <coughs> I should have brought water <laughs> Uh huh. So, do you want to? <clears throat> there, you. Would you describe the triggers for your symptoms? There, there are so many different ones, and um, there are chemicals and electromagnetic radiation. Uh, you even mentioned uh, reacting to Wi-Fi. Um, do you want to? Um, do you want to just? Uh, talk about those symptoms how what are the triggers and um, how do you react to these symptoms and how do you find relief for them okay that's a really good question um, 
Well, for triggers, mold is a huge thing for me. Cell towers, electrical, 5G, fragrances, the cleaning chemicals places use, um, people in places, building supplies, cigarette smoke, campfires. There's, there's so many things, and it all depends on how I feel. It depends on a lot of things. Like I might be able to tolerate one thing one day, but not the other things. And I just had too many things in my toxic load for that day. Um, some of the symptoms are swollen stomach, uh, peak in blood pressure, heart rate changes, energy, um, fatigue, mood fluctuations. Um, I could be, I could be hyper or fatigued depending. There's just, there's so many factors, uh, brain fog, concentration. And at one point I, um, I was in a place where there was mold, which brought me close to death and it was, uh, I had acute uh, kidney failure or acute renal failure. And what I had to do was leave the environment and they had everybody waiting at emergency and getting all ready. And I knew it was the environment. So my environmental doctor and I decided that I was just going to leave the environment. So for me, I left the environment and a week later, my had t- got tested again and I no longer had acute renal failure. So for me, the symptoms are severe for, and for so many of us. So avoiding is pretty much what I have to do. And sometimes I do have to tolerate certain things. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. <laughs> You're listening to CQ W95.9 FM. At FM, this is Mary Jane Eason. I'm talking to Marie LeBlanc about, about uh, her work, her artwork, and her uh, her struggles with uh, chemical sensitivities and electromagnetic sensitivities, and this is wooden spoons, and um, and so this is CQW ninety five point nine FM. So um, there there are just uh, there there are so many things. I mean, <clears throat> when I'm thinking about. You living where you are, you are living in a van. Maybe you might want to talk about your your living situation. You are living in a van. You are no longer in Manitoba. You are in Alberta. And um, you, there, there, what, what is it like living in a van? I wonder how do you get your food? How do you cook your food? All those very, basic questions that we take for granted how do you how do you navigate all that <laughs> oh that's a challenge it depends where i'm at depends how much fun we have if i want to cook but yeah uh, i i migrate to and from the u.s to prevent my freezing to death and uh well what i do so pretty much can I just sort of say what I do on a, a daily basis and how I obtain shelter and food and that kind of all fits in the question? Sure. Okay. So I, so I, a lot of times at night, I'm not really starting at the beginning of the day, but at night there's campfires. So I'll park and I'll try to find a place to park. And this is when I'm down in the, in the state. So there's, there's different places I could park for shelter. There's um, bureau land management land, parking lots if, if I have to in a certain town, um, but I have to also, I don't necessarily need my meter all the time, but I have a meter that reads, that reads magnetic, electric, and radio, radio RF, and it helps me of where I can kind of locate myself with, with the less, the least amount of effects. Um, so when I'm cooking, I get up in the morning and I'm, well, I know you, most people have a shower and things like that. So I will have my bird bath, and a lot of times it's cold water. And uh, then when I go to cook my food, I have to rely on the sun. I can rely on my solar if I want to, but if I want to have heat, now I have uh, a heater. I have to now even depend, like throughout the day, I have to try and figure out, okay, if I want heat at night and there's no sun, uh, what do I do? So some days I really just have to watch what I eat, eat cold food from the cooler because I do have a solar cooker. Um, food is a challenge because I can't keep my cooler on 24-7, and uh, that also depends on the sun. So I waste a lot of food, and not on purpose. I don't want to, 
So I try and buy what I can and go through it as fast as possible and cook it and try and save it that way. Sometimes if it's so hot out and, and I don't have all the proper solar, it just it just doesn't work that way. And I try and eat it until, you know, it just, at a certain point, you just can't. <laughs> and so it's just throughout the day, I have to just watch my environment. Laundry is a huge thing. Sometimes I have to put 10 miles to get water and I can only put so much water in a few buckets. Then I have to go back. And many folks think I have nothing to do in the desert. They have no idea how busy I am and how much in survival mode it is and what I have to do. So when you're not living in the desert, when you're here, like right now you're not, and you're in Alberta right now, mm-hmm. and you have to get food, where do you go for food? How do you, if you go to uh, where there are more people, you are going to be uh, affected by all the different things, um, contaminants around you, how do you find yeah. your food? The, the, well, okay, roughly. sometimes... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Pardon me? Oh. Yeah, go uh, ahead. I thought I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, sometimes, um, sometimes people will go and help me. They will go for me if I, I find people offer to go for me. Um, sometimes there's farmer's market. Uh, sometimes people have gardens and and I can get food that way. And lately I have been going in myself and it is quite a challenge. You know, it's, it's what do I do? I pick my poison for the day. I guess I have to, I, I can't starve, <laughs> you know, so it makes it really hard. Then I have to, then I don't feel good after I go, but I mean, certain things I just have to weigh out, you know, what am I going to do? How's it going to affect me? What am I doing the next day or later on that day? It's just, it's, it's, it's a balancing act. Yeah, so you have to this as a struggle in trying to keep things from spoiling and uh, also having to limit the number of times you have to go looking for food. It, it's uh it's not a simple situation. And no, I and mean, then lately, of oh, course. Yeah. And the other thing is uh where you are staying, <clears throat> you have to find wherever it seems to be okay for you to stay because you might be on other people's property, perhaps? Yeah, so right now on someone else's property, and it's really cold, and they actually have a a huge shop kind of thing that I can pull the van in, and it's warmer there, and I will do that, I guess, until I go down to the state. And this is what you do every year. You go down to, to Arizona, and um, you are saying that uh, it's not exactly uh, the, the people that, that go to Arizona to live in the desert, like yourself, it's not a glamorous thing because it's a place for environmental refugees, that many of them are abandoned by friends and family and who do not understand and are, they are left without medical support. So you're saying that the people that go to Arizona, they are surviving but not thriving. Do you want to talk about about that sojourn that you make every year um, in your van to live in Arizona? Um, like, So when I leave Canada, I, I cross the border and... Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not because of how my van is adapted. And I make the trip down there, and, and it's it's a challenge because I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to stay. Um, I meet so many people down there, and it's so sad to see them struggling even worse than I am. And they, they often ask me, why am I why am I smiling? How can I smile? And for me, that's my coping mechanism. Unfortunately, sometimes that is my coping mechanism. So if I'm really in trouble, people just don't know because I've went to that coping mechanism. I'm not sure if I answered your question there. No, but I mean, you you know, you go there every year. And um, so you have, you have a safe space in terms of there's no um, environmental contaminants? 
Um, well, yeah, I, I would go to BLM land um, or, or on some sometimes on someone's um, property. It just it just all depends on so many things. If there's a campfire, I have to leave. Then I have to find another space. So it's 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 just a lot of times it's just a lot of constant moving or things like that. It, it's just really a challenge. So there's a place that you can camp out with in your van in Arizona. Well, there's I usually there's sometimes on on someone's property or on BLM land like Bureau Land Management. So that like free land, kind of like Crown Land, Crown Land here. Mm-hmm. So I'll go around and go on to different BLM land. You're allowed to camp a certain number of days, and then you have to leave. And at a certain time of the year, there's a lot of people around. And I have to, you know, think of wind direction and, and all these other things of of um, where am I going to park the van and have to think of the next place I might have to go if if I can't tolerate it there because sometimes in the middle of the night I have to go. And it's, it's kind of hard to get out of a spot if you're not familiar with it. You know, it's like, okay, which way did I come in? So I try to park the van in a certain way so I know there's the exit and I know that's the way out and the van's pointing the way out. Because sometimes you can't really tell where you're going at night. And then that, that's a kind of a risk, risky situation, too, because your van, you have to depend on your van for your life. You, to, it has to be in working order. And, I mean, those are survival uh, needs to have your van in good order. <clears throat> and most people, you know, um, would would be concerned about what if their van broke down or something like that. Oh, you yeah. You have good luck with your van or you're, you, <laughs> you have a good relationship with your van or something. I'm not sure. People tell me I should love my van. <laughs> I can always say I my van. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so 99% of the time when I was down there, uh, well, most of the time it was broken down, and I couldn't find someone to look at it. And if I did find someone to look at it, you know, it, it really depended on the characters walk, you know, who came out from the desert of who was going to look at my van. But on my way back to Canada, the van tire, the tire blew up at the border, so I had to get towed to a location. And then I was towed like three times. And at another point in time, I thought, okay, I can drive the van if I drive it slowly. Then it stopped at, right between two highways. So a peace officer comes along and says he should put, push me into safety. Well, the axle fell off, so it wasn't so safe. So I had to wait for the tow truck. So it was really hard because I was then parked on someone's land, no way to go. Um, they were really nice, the, nice folks to let me park there. I walked into town to get groceries. They would help offer to get groceries. So my van, it's, it's been a curse and a blessing at the same time. Um, because I have met a lot of nice people throughout the van breakdown. <laughs> so it, I had some people help me fix it enough to get it going, but it's not necessarily enough um, probably to get me down there. So we're, we're working on trying to get something something else, working towards that right now. I don't, I'm running out of time. Well, I think you have guardian angels around you to guide you in all these <clears throat> excursions that you have. That's for sure. There's, <laughs> in my mind, there's no doubt about it that you have some kind of protective uh, protection around you. And um, there, there must be. Yeah, there is. <laughs> and and thank but, you for that. Anyway, um, part of your work, uh, Maria, is, of course, <clears throat> is educating people about environmental disease. Do, do you want to just comment on that and how you go about doing that? And, and, and I know that you're doing that through your show that you're having at the, at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights on the October 20th. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so many are struggling and they're not able to have their basic needs met. They have little to no access to public transportation, public spaces that are spent and fragrant free, little to zero access to housing. For them, it's a medical need. And there's little to no access to assistive devices, you know, and, you know, and items medically necessary for a better quality of life, such as, um, you know, the various meters that we need to measure our environment that I call that an assistive device. 
um, and and there's really no way to help them navigate the system that's there to help them. And um, they also have little to no access to adequately trained medical practitioners in environmental medicine. And like with the handful of doctors we do have, there's over a million people diagnosed with environmental sensitivities in Canada. And so many are left without a diagnosis going from doctor to doctor or worse yet. Um, they have no access to the doctor because they get so sick when they go in there and the, mo- most of them don't really understand. So, and they also lose the support, including family members and they're scrutinized at every turn. And, um, and recently a lady chose maid as a medical assistance in dying. And, um, you know, she, it just saddens me that people have to even consider that option because they have no access to the, and they're living in abject poverty and have no access to the proper housing and, and medical that they need for a better quality of life. Mm-hmm. What kind of legislation would you like to see written into Canadian law? I know that <clears throat> that this is a big issue and um, you have some ideas about that or whether there is um, this kind of effort being made to have legislation introduced through, in different parts of the world because um, this is a disease that... Um, is uh, present, invisible, invisible disease, you could say. Do you want to talk about the legislation that you would like to see written into Canadian law? Yeah, I really I really would like to have an international classification of diseases code and billing fee code so that we could, we could um, then have the proper diagnosis and the treatment, the proper housing that we can get. We, we don't have that. We're, we're still stuck, you know. And, and besides an international classification of diseases code, billing fee code, more adequately trained doctors um, in environmental medicine and our right to a healthy environment, there are many other things to consider that could help all of us in the world, the planet, plants and the animals, such as, you know, pesticides. Like, they cause so many issues. I can't tell you how many people I have come across who react so bad to pesticides. And many people are carelessly using them on lawns, causing mosquitoes, and so much more. Um, so I'm, I'm the cost. Also, the cost of eating um, um, organic non-GMO is, is so expensive. But that's what we need to heal. It would be nice if, if you know, that would be a little bit cheaper for us. And, and that was that was mainstream. Um, and when people are spraying. It would be nice if, you know, the neighbors could notify beforehand. I mean, it would be nice if they didn't spray at all, but if they could notice the neighbors. And I think in Winnipeg, didn't didn't we have something where you could opt out of something? You could phone in the city for something? Well, we had a cosmetic pesticide ban in Winnipeg, and that's for the city of Winnipeg, which meant that um, pesticides were not allowed. They were not sold. Um the lawn care people try to reinstate, try to overturn that pesticide ban, but they didn't go too far. <clears throat> but they were, the lawn care people want to have the pesticide ban overturned. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen because that's a big step forward to have this ban in place. And um, we just have to start understanding, start having respect for creation and for the beauty of nature. And to mm-hmm. change, we have to do the changing um, in terms of our attitudes. So, yeah, mm-hmm. so we, we're well, hopefully, um, I doubt if they can ever overturn that ban because it's, um, <clears throat> well, it's been supported uh, by so many people. Yeah. And, and and another thing is fragrance. That's a whole other issue. If you watch the movie Stink, like S T I N K with an exclamation mark, you'll see the struggle and and the vast amount of chemicals used in the word fragrance. It, in that in that movie, from what I recall, someone actually died or had an anaphylactic shock from ass. When does the consumer begin to know what, what they're consuming? 
um, and we need to read labels and, you know, mm-hmm. understand the ingredients. Because now I see that you can flip the page almost on a bottle to read the labels. And man, I, I I'm not I'm not going to read that far. And um, there's also the opt out on smart meters, which is often a sight because I know I was in an area and I had to get rid of a smart meter, and that was a challenge. And 5G being installed without our consent. Um, besides research on effects, if they're going to install um, 5G, maybe let people know where it is because it seems like um, they're just going to they're just going to do it, and people are going to get sick. So maybe there's a way they can uh, at least let us know. You yes, know that I'm, yes. I'm glad you mentioned the 5G because I just watched a webinar the other day uh, about the proliferation of 5G. And it's a kind of a, 5G is a collection of frequencies, apparently, that piggybacks on 4G, 3G, and all the other Gs. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, what the experts are saying, that we won't see the impacts of this technology for 20 to 30 years because diseases like cancer is latent in development and animals don't reproduce at warp speed, so we do not see the dangers of it. We do not. We won't be seeing the harm from 5G until 20 or 30 years later down the road. So that sounds really, really uh, threatening, but that's the reality. And so um, in the absence of any hard data, the tech companies are just going ahead with impunity, and they're setting up 5G uh, everywhere they can. Uh, but the unknown costs will be felt later. So we are not going to escape uh, the the damages of 5G. We're going to, it's going to come later in the future. We're preparing our future. And so um, <clears throat> this was an interesting uh, 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 webinar that I watched. And then apparently uh, also there was commentary that the millimeter wave studies uh, completed by the military in Russia raised many red flags. So <clears throat> so I'm sure that you have your concerns about 5G <laughs> as you are, you know, uh, uh, sensitive to Wi-Fi and all those, uh, all those types of things. Oh, yes. Um, I have a lot of concerns about it. Um, and I would say... Russia is definitely right on the mark on that because um, for me, the, if you're saying way in the future, well, for the future is now right now for me because I'm already affected by the 5G. Um, the effects of the introduction of technology like 5G are not always invisible until it's too late, kind of kind of like you say there. And the existing technology like 4G is not going away. And you can see effects on the natural world. You know, men carrying cell phones in their pockets, women carrying a cell phone in their bra, reproduction issues, excuse me, reproduction issues, brain tumors from listening to a cell phone held to your head. They're all issues of concern with the current technology. What's going to happen with 5G down the road? We see impacts of higher frequencies on insects. Um, and I was speaking with Meg Sears. I think she's going to be on with you um, on another show. And... She's from Prevent Cancer Now, and this is this totally be up her alley. I kind of asked her some questions about this, and you know, the higher frequency added on for 5G will have different impacts in the future. There's evidence showing we're not most vulnerable species. Trees, for example, they're static and they can't go away. People, we can come and go. So, what happens to the trees and the insects who are getting ongoing exposure? And um, like, there's concerning ecological science accumulated over decades. We see the crashing populations of birds, um, insects becoming extinct or endangered. I'm not sure the right word. Um, and I'm talking with Meg the other day, you know, crashing population of birds is accelerating, but just as so as we roll out new technology. So it seems like it's going hand in hand. So maybe that is kind of the missing link in the biodiversity problem. Um, so, Megan is the chair of Prevent Cancer Now, a lead scientist, senior research assistant of Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, and the author of the paper, Medical Perspectives on Environmental Sensitivities, commissioned by the Canadian Human Rights in 2007, which is still valid today. For me, that's a huge thing that one of the 
the biggest things I think of when my, my show is at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is a paper that she wrote in 2007. In speaking with her, um, it's important as far as biodiversity goes that it's not only the human suffering. And Prevent Cancer Now has applied to have an event in the event happening December, I think it's Montreal, I think, by the United Nations on Biodiversity, Canada is hosting it um, this year. So we're all hoping the government of Canada will give Prevent Cancer Now a venue to the missing link in um, like the, the kind of biodiversity. biodiversity. So it, I hope that they, they really, really get in there because it would be really, really nice. Well, thank you so much, Marie, for joining us and sharing all the information that you have. And um, your pro, your show is going to be on uh, October the 29th at the Human Rights Museum. Is it at 1 o'clock, I believe? Mm-hmm. The yeah. program? Yes. So, um, and people have to... Yep. So this is an opportunity to see your work and learn about environmental uh, safety and environmental disease and how to protect oneself. And, uh, yeah, thank and you people, so much. Yes? You're welcome. Sorry, people have to have to apply. Um, they, we could go to Arts and Accessibility Network Manitoba. In order for them to go to the event, uh, they can go in person or um, online, and they have to actually um, sign up and register through, I think it's called event, event, Eventbrite. But it shows it on the Arts and Accessibility Network in Manitoba, and the art show is called Crip Strength, Art and Body and Mind. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning, Marie, and all the best in all your all your efforts and endeavors and all the work that you are doing, which is making a big difference. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. And it is 8.43 in the morning. Mary Jane, do you have some other things you'd like to tell us this morning? Uh, yeah, I have a few announcements to make. Um, there's been some, I think, some changes in our thinking around a lot of things concerning uh, the coronavirus and so on. And uh, the New York Supreme Court handed... I just read in the news that the New York Supreme Court handed a massive victory to to unvaccinated city workers on Tuesday this week, ordering the city to rehire workers who were fired and to give them back their back pay. So that was quite an interesting uh, reversal. Um, At the same time, there was a book that came out early on when the pandemic started, Corona Fall, it's titled... Corona False Alarm Facts and Figures, uh, written by Dr. Strat Back. And uh, this particular book is full of a lot of information, but the the information is still relevant. And um, he now, this Dr. Bakti is now uh, having having. Um, having uh, talks uh, talks that can be uh, listened to uh, uh, explaining what is happening and so on. Um, one of the first things that happened really early on and when the, the virus uh, surfaced uh, was that um, the uh, PCR test was developed so that it would... Um, would actually create false positives. The PCR test was developed by Dr. Kerry Mullis, and he who he developed that PCR test, and he made it very evident that it should not be used for diagnosis, and that at the magnification of 35 to 45 millimeters, whatever that magnification is, uh, that it would be giving false positives and should not be used at that magnification. Well, guess what? Certain I would say people with criminal minds in Germany were wanting to make a lot of money on this. And so they overruled that. Doctor, somebody called Dr. Darsten, Durston. And so they ex- did exactly that. They, they set the PCR test at the magnification of 35 uh, millimeters or whatever, and 35 to 45. 
where it gave um, a high number of false positives. We also know that this happened, uh, that this had been discussed when there was um, a lawsuit initiated by the Centre for Justice um, against the Manitoba government with Dr. Brent Rusin had to testify. Of course, he didn't know anything about the PCR test magnification, uh, but Dr. Uh, Buller from the Cadham Lab certainly did because they work with coronaviruses all the time, and they know when the magnification is too high that they have to they get false positives, and he testified to the same, the same thing and having to do tests all over again. And so this is uh, an interesting development um, that we have, we, we need to come to terms with some of this uh, kind of um, <laughs> tomfoolery that has been going on in the past. Anyway, um, we have, I wanted to, to share some recipes, and uh, this is, uh, Halloween is coming along too, and so I thought I would share a pumpkin recipe, and... Um, because we have so many, and pumpkins are such a wonderful food. They are full of vitamin A. You can tell by the fact that they have such a, a, a brilliant orange color. And in fact, there are some people that actually take the pumpkin peel. Um, they can grate it, sort of like how you would grate an orange peel. And you can get a very fine uh, type of, pumpkin pieces that you can add to things for color, for for vitamin A, for for things like that. And this is uh, my Portuguese friend, Adelina, has shared that with me, how in Portugal they, they use that part of the pumpkin, the skin, because it's so full of, uh, so full of uh, nutrients. So if you have a pumpkin, do not throw it away. To me, it's a sacrilege to do that. Pumpkins are a valuable, beautiful food, and we should honor them. Um, so here's a, a very quick recipe for a small, you can use a small pumpkin. Um, cut it in half and to scoop out the seeds. The seeds can be roasted. They're very nourishing as well. So you take out the seeds and, and the uh, pith of the from the pumpkin and cut it into cubes. And then what you do is you heat a frying pan with some oil, use olive oil on not too high heat, and add some finely chopped onion and some garlic and the pumpkin that you have cut up into cubes. And then you can just saute that slowly as stirring it often. And you can cover it too to, to hasten the cooking. And so the pumpkin will, will cook into a vegetable. It will soften and, and sort of break down. And you have a very nice pumpkin, um, pumpkin vegetable. Season it with salt and pepper. And, uh, some people like to use hot peppers, chili peppers, depending on their, their uh, um, inclination and um, so that's one thing you can do uh, another thing uh, often pumpkin is used with curry powder <clears throat> so you could also add curry powder to the pumpkin mixture but all together you can have a very um, it's somewhat a bit delicate but very tasty vegetable made out of pumpkin that has been has been stewed slowly and uh, fried slowly in a in a, a frying pan, and so that I think that that's what we should be doing on Halloween is doing a lot of cooking all those pumpkins, and um, if you can't eat them all at the same time, you can actually uh, cut them and freeze them, uh, cook them or cook them down and, and freeze them as a uh, puree and you can use them for later on for soups and they make excellent soups. This is also a time of the year where there's a lot of flus going around and um, I was given a recipe and I'm going to share this, a recipe for flus and colds and it's called a chai spice mix and I didn't make it myself because I have to get one item um, which um, I can easily get at a 
at a um, um, an Eastern uh, store. Um, it's called okay. It's called a chai spice mix, and what you need is three black cardamoms and twenty green cardamoms, one tablespoon of fennel, and one teaspoon of carom seeds or ajuan seeds. I don't have those seeds myself, but they can be um, found at a halal, a halal store nearby. And, um, and then five or six peppercorns, eight cloves, and then one and a half inch uh, cinnamon stick, and a bit of black tea. Now you take all this, you put this all together, and you grind it up in a food grinder, and uh, so you're going to get about uh, um, you're going to get about a quarter cup from that, and you put that in a glass container. So now, if you want to make a tea, you just take one teaspoon in a cup of water, and you simmer that for ten minutes. And uh, this is a very a very good tea for anybody that has a cold or a flu. Very warming and very easy to make. So you just have to get the spices together, and that's where I'm at. I haven't gotten them all. I just am missing one thing. I also thought, you know, today is a good time. This is a good time to also to uh, to take care of all the vegetables that are coming, that are being harvested. And there's such an ar- array of vegetables. There's turnips and beets and carrots and potato. Well, potatoes. Uh, there's cauliflower. There's just so many different vegetables that we could um, we can actually use them in pickling. And so here's another quick recipe that I think I can fit in. Um, this is one that I I thought would be kind of interesting. It's pickled turnips because people don't often use turnips that much, and turnips are really um, they have their they have an unusual flavor. And they are very uh, flavorful, actually. So if you have two and a half cups of turnips, peeled and quartered and sliced, and then three quarter cups of beets, peeled, quartered, and sliced, and then a tablespoon of sea salt, and four tablespoons of whey. Now, whey, can, you can find the whey. That is uh, the, you may, it, we don't have the, 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 um, <clears throat> benefit of not of unpasteurized milk so the I guess the best way to get whey is to buy yogurt and the liquid on top of the yogurt uh, is uh, is the whey and it has a sour flavor it's acidic uh, another way of getting that way of to extract it is to put the yogurt through a cheesecloth over a strainer and so what will come out will be the liquid, which will be the whey. And so you can add that. Or if you don't want to use whey at all, then you can just use uh, one cup of um, just just um, a cup of filtered water and not, not use any whey and just use an extra tablespoon of salt. So you would use your, you have your turnip and your beets and an extra tablespoon of salt um, and a cup of filtered water. So you mix the vegetables and place them in a quart-sized wide mouth mason jar and you press down lightly with a wooden mallet or a spoon and then you mix the water with the salt and the whey if you're using and pour it over the vegetables adding more water as needed to cover the turnip mixture. The top of the vegetable should be at least uh, one inch below the top of the jar. So there should be a space there, about a, about an inch space at the top of the jar. And then you cover tightly and keep at room temperature for about three days. And and by during that period of time, there will be um, fermentation taking place. And then after that, you just move it into a cold storage. So that is just a very simple, simple um, way of uh, using some of your vegetables.
And I think we are at the top of the hour here. Thanks, Mary Jane. Those are program. great. Those are great recipes. And it's Debbie here. And I've got Andrew in the studio today with me. So he's learning the ropes and he's going to sign us off today. You have been listening to Wooden Spoons, sponsored by MJCS Inc. on CKUW 95.9 FM. If you didn't catch some of the things we were talking about today, please visit our website at www.ckuw.ca. Type Wooden Spoons into the search bar. The podcast of the show will be up in just a few hours. Until next time, this is Andrew with your host, Mary Jane Eason, saying bye for now and thanks for listening. Stay tuned for Democracy Now!